So as we already know, the citric acid cycle is super important to our cells because the cells not only use the citric acid cycle to actually generate those NADH molecules which are then used by the electron transport chain to create the high energy ATP molecules, but the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle is also used to actually produce the building blocks that are used by our cells. And this is summarized in this diagram. So pyruvate is transformed into acetyl-coenzyme A via pyruvate decarboxylation and then that acetyl-coenzyme A is fed into the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle. And in this cycle, we not only use that acetyl-coenzyme A to form the ATP molecules via oxidative phosphorylation, but some of the intermediate molecules of the TCA cycle are also actually used to form many building blocks used by the cells of our body. For instance, citrate molecules via a specific type of pathway that we're going to focus on in a future lecture can be used to synthesize fats, fatty acid molecules. Alpha ketoglutarate, another intermediate of the TCA cycle, can be used to form glutamate amino acids and other amino acids, and we can also actually form purine nitrogenous bases. Succinyl coenzyme A, a third intermediate of the citric acid cycle, can be used to form heme groups and porphyrin groups. So remember, these groups are used by enzymes such as hemoglobin and myoglobin. And we also have oxaloacetate that can actually be used in gluconeogenesis to form glucose molecules. And on top of that, we can also use oxaloacetate to form other amino acids and purine nitrogenous bases as well as pyrimidine nitrogenous bases. So the point is, this is the center of metabolism. All the fuel molecules that we use to break down into ATP, this is where the fuel molecules end up. On top of that, we can use these intermediates of the citric acid cycle to basically produce many different types of amino acids and bases and glucose molecules, as well as other important groups used by the enzymes and proteins of our body. Now, what I'd like to focus on in this lecture briefly is the following idea. Because the citric acid cycle is so important, we have to make sure that the concentrations, the levels of these intermediate molecules is actually kept in check. So the concentration, the level of these molecules cannot actually drop below a certain value because if it does, the citric acid cycle will not actually take place. And so I'd like to focus on a, spe <coughs> a specific type of process that allows us to actually regenerate and, 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 and um, replenish the concentration of oxaloacetate, which in turn allows us to actually replenish the concentration of all these other intermediates. So remember, because this is a cyclic process, because we begin with oxaloacetate and then go back to that oxaloacetate, what that means is by replenishing the concentration of oxaloacetate, we in turn replenish the concentration of all the other intermediate molecules that are needed to produce all these different types of building blocks as well as the NADH molecules which are needed to form ATP along the electron transport chain. So what is this process that allows us to actually replenish the oxaloacetate concentration? Well, it's a process that we actually discussed when we discussed gluconeogenesis. So Remember in our discussion on, glu on uh, gluconeogenesis, in gluconeogenesis, the first step in that process is to transform the pyruvate molecule into oxaloacetate. And the enzyme that catalyzes this step is pyruvate carboxylase. So pyruvate carboxylase essentially attaches a carbon dioxide molecule onto that pyruvate to form oxaloacetate. In the process, we essentially break down an ATP to drive this process in this direction. So 
we see that by attaching a carbon uh, dioxide onto the pyruvate, we are able to form the oxaloacetate, and that allows us to keep, to maintain a specific minimal level concentration of the oxaloacetate within the citric acid cycle, which in turn allows us to maintain a specific level of the other intermediates, and that allows all these important processes to continue taking place inside our cells. So, for the citric acid cycle to keep up with the energy demands of the cell and the demands of producing all these different types of biological building blocks, the concentrations of the intermediate molecules within the TCA cycle must be regulated. So we must maintain a minimal level of those intermediates. So when our cells, for instance, deplete the concentration of oxaloacetate by, for instance, producing all these different types of building blocks, we essentially want to replenish the concentration via a specific type of reaction that is catalyzed by pyruvate carboxylase. So in this step, we attach a CO2 molecule onto pyruvate to form the, uh, the four carbon molecule known as oxaloacetate. In the process, we hydrolyze an ATP by using water to basically drive the synthesis of this molecule in this general direction. So. When we have plenty of ATP molecules inside our body, right, because if our energy value is low, we have a relatively high concentration of ATP. Under these conditions, the oxaloacetate will be transformed into a variety of products. Why? Well, because we're not going to need to use the oxaloacetate to actually generate those NADH molecules, to use the NADH molecules to produce ATP via the electron transport chain. And so instead of using the oxaloacetate to produce ATP, we're going to use the oxaloacetate to generate all these different types of biological molecules, such as glucose, specific amino acids, purine bases, and pyr uh, pyrimidine bases. Now, if we have low energy charge values in a cell, if we have a relatively low amount of ATP in such cases, we do want to actually form those ATP molecules, the NADH molecules, and in turn the ATP molecules. And so under these conditions, the pyruvate will be used to replenish the concentration of oxaloacetate so that they can be used, the oxaloacetate can be used to actually synthesize those NADH molecules that can then be used by the electron transport chain to generate those ATP. So in the next series of lectures, we're going to move on and focus on the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation.